Welcome back, now we'll look at paper 12 of the May June 2024 series. Now as you probably know the mark scheme has been released already so if you just want to check that you know go ahead. Um, however some people maybe they want like an extra explanation uh, because yeah they check the mark scheme or you know there's a few topics they're still not sure about. Um, so yeah that's what I'll try and do in this video okay just uh, obviously give my answers and also you know go through my reasoning for why I actually give the answer. Um, and as always, right, if the video is too slow, watch on 1.25 or 1.5 times the speed. Right, question one, data can be measured in bits. Give the name of the data storage measurement that is equal to eight bits. Uh, right, so eight, bit, uh, well, eight bits is just gonna be one byte. All right, so hopefully that's not too difficult. Um, and I mean, they, they don't really often ask it, but if they ask four bits, uh, well, four bits is then just gonna be a nibble. And the way you can think of that is, I mean, well, thinking here is like kind of a food metaphor, right, about, you know, eating food. Um, you might say, uh, I don't know, maybe like a mouse nibbled the cheese, because obviously a mouse is small, so they're having a small bite of the cheese. Whereas if, you know, you say bite, um, and I, I guess what in, in English you spell, yeah, bite like this, uh, in terms of, you know, the food kind of spelling. Um, but, you know, when you say, I don't know, maybe like, like uh, let's say the lion, well, bit, or yeah, bite, yeah, I mean, obviously it's the wrong tense, but you say uh, maybe the lion had a bite of the human um, because obviously a lion is going to have a big bite, whereas, yeah, like a mouse is going to have a small nibble, right? So that's why well, a nibble is going to be, you know, smaller. Um, and obviously a bite is going to be bigger um, because, yeah, a bite is going to be eight bits. Uh, yeah, maybe that made sense or maybe it didn't. Right, state how many bits there are in a kibby bite. Uh, so actually, I will admit, I, I did look at this before and I actually got this wrong because I didn't recognize that it said bite, not bit. Um, so what we want to think, well, kibby is going to be 1024. Okay, but then also to go from bits to bytes, we also need to multiply by eight. Um, so effectively what we're doing then, uh, well, kibby is going to be, yeah, 1024. All right, and then we're going to be timesing eight. And this is actually a bit tricky, but... I mean, maybe you just know this is, uh, what well, yeah, 1892. Um, and of course, you know, you could like multiply this using some uh, like grid multiplication method or yeah, however you like multiply on paper. Um, and I mean, you know, just to recap, well, so Kibby is gonna be obviously 1024, right? Which we can also write here as two to the power of 10. Uh, maybe, well, maybe then it's gonna be 1024, right? Multiplied by 1024, um, right? That's also equal to uh, two to the power of 20. Um, of course, Gibby is going to be, well, 1024 multiplied by 1024 multiplied by 1024, right? Of course, well, that's 2 to the power of 30. Um, yeah, Tebby, of course, well, it's going to be 4 1024s, uh, 2 to the power of 40, right, etc. Um, yeah, and so that, that's kind of useful for the next question as well, which we'll see, uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, right, so we want to give the name of the data storage measurement that is equal to 104 Gibby bytes. Um, so, like we said, um, because, you know, well, 1024 bits is going to be a kibby byte, right? Therefore, 1024 kibby bytes is going to be a mebby byte, uh, right? 1024 mebby bytes is then going to be a gibby byte, uh, hence 1024 gibby bytes, right? That's then going to be a tebby byte. Uh, okay, right, bytes. Yeah, there we go. Um, right, then the next one, a 16-bit color image has a resolution of 512 wide by 512 pixels high. Uh, calculate the file size of the image in Kibby bytes and show all of your working. Now, this one is a bit tricky um, because, I mean, well, let, let's say, you know, to be honest, the way I did it is in my head, which actually is not really the best method, to be honest. But what I thought is I thought, well, 16 bits, uh, that's going to be two bytes then if we're thinking about in terms of powers of 1024, well, 512 is going to be, you know, half of 1024, so let's say 0 0.5. Um, obviously, yeah, this and that again, right, 0 0.5. So if we just multiply these together, because, of course, well, the uh, number of pixels is the resolution, right, which is, well, 512 by 512, uh, right, multiplied by the color depth or bit depth. Um, so if we multiply all of those together, well, 2 times 0 0.5 is going to be 1, Right, multiply by 0 0.5, uh, that's going to be 0 0.5. So what we're saying is that the whole thing uh, is going to be 0 0.5 mebby bytes. Uh, sorry, okay, no, mebby bits. Um, okay, no, 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 all right, sorry, yeah, okay, mebby bytes, because we, we've converted this into bytes already. Um, 
and you, you, you know, I mean, again, the, the reason it's uh, 0 0.5 mebi bytes is because, well, if this was 1024 times 1024, right, of course, well, that's going to be a 1 mebi byte, right? Because, again, we've seen that a mebi byte is, well, 1024 times 1024, right, 2 to the power of 20. Um, so effectively, what we're saying is we've got, uh, well, 0 0.5 mebi bytes, but then we actually want it in kibi bytes. So then we have to multiply this by 1024. Okay, because again, 0 0.5 mebi bytes times 1024, that's going to get us to kibi bytes, right, which is 512. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I did that in my head, which honestly is probably quite confusing. You know, I also get confused with that. Um, it, it's not really the most robust method. So I did notice that you can actually do it uh, just by writing down the sum and then just uh, kind of simple, uh, let's say simplifying the calculation. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, my maths is a bit rusty, so I guess that's why I didn't really think of this. Um, so again, well, first we want to calculate the number of pixels, uh, sorry, okay, the number of bits, which is this, okay, because 16 bits per pixel, uh, and then again, this is the number of pixels we have, right? Then in order to go from bits into kibby bytes, well, first we want to divide by 8, because dividing by 8 gets us from bits into bytes. Uh, then, of course, we want to divide by 1024, right, which gets us from bytes into kibby bytes. Um, so let's give what 8 times 1024. Um, and now if you just simplify this, well, we can say uh, 16, uh, 16 and 8, they can kind of cancel. So now it's going to be, what, 2 times 512. All right, that's going to be over 1024. Now, if we then think, well, 2 times 512, right, this is just 1024. So effectively, right, this 1024 and this 1024 is going to cancel, uh, which that's then going to give us, what, 512 over 1, right, or, of course, just 512, right, like that. Uh, right next one so data can be transmitted from one device to another tick one box to show which of the terms is not a method for transmitting data um, right I mean so serial data transmission that obviously is right just sending one bit at a time uh, simplex again that's also uh, transmission so that's going to be send uh, well basically sending data in one direction only um, parallel well this is when of course we have multiple wires so we're sending multiple bits simultaneously um, and then, well, parity, of course, this is not, right, because that's like odd parity, even parity. Um, so I guess we can call that sort of, well, uh, yeah, I, I guess we can call this sort of, you know, error checking or, yeah, error detection. Um, yeah, not really transmission. Um, and, I mean, if we think about the other ones, well, of course, we've got simplex, which is going to be one direction only. Uh, right, then we've got half duplex, which is going to be both directions, but not at the same time. Right, and then we just got full duplex, which that's going to be both directions, like and at the same time. Um, so of course, yeah, full duplex would be the best. Uh, right, data is broken down into smaller units to be transmitted from one device to another. Give the name of the unit that the data is broken down into. Right, so I think this then, you know, if you've got like a massive file, like I don't know, a video or something, um, of course you're not going to send that entire like five gigabyte video in one go. Right, it's going to be broken down into smaller parts. Um, and yeah, those smaller parts, they're just going to be the packets. All right, so that should be our answer for this one. Right, data is often encrypted when it is transmitted from one device to another. Explain how data is encrypted using symmetric encryption. Right, so symmetric encryption, let's say we've got A and B. Um, well, here they're, well, here they're going to have the same private key. And if A is sending to B, right, they're going to have the plain text. Uh, they're going to encrypt the plain text with this private key. Um, this will make it into ciphertext. Um, or I, I guess well, we'll call the encrypted version ciphertext. Uh, of course, you know this ciphertext is then sent to B. Right, B will then decrypt the ciphertext using the same private key. Um, and then, yeah, when they decrypt it, right, they should get back to the original plain text. Um, and of course, you know if B wants to send to A, well, again, they're going to encrypt using the same uh, the same private key. Again, A will decrypt using the same private key. Um, so yeah, really, we just want to explain that. So let's say. Uh, yeah, let's say the same private key. Um, right, I'm going to try and do sort of shorthand, right? The same private key uh, used, uh, well, obviously for, but let's just say both parties. Uh, right, let's say to encrypt, right, and decrypt. Uh, right, let's say for encryption. Uh, right, the plain text. Um, and I mean, I, I guess here we're kind of just repeating ourselves, really. Uh, but for encryption, uh, plain text will be, uh, yeah, obviously, right, will be encrypted. 
uh, right with private key. Um, right, unless they get and transmitted to receiver or recipient. Uh, right, transmit to receiver. Um, let's say, right, yeah, who will then decrypt? Uh, right, with. Yeah, no, I think I mean let, let's make sure let's make sure to use the keyword ciphertext. Uh, right, so for encryption, plain text will be encrypted. Um, let's say maybe two ciphertext. Uh, right with private key and transmit to receiver who will decrypt. Uh, yeah, let's why well, again right with same private key. Um, yeah, that should be fine. Let's say uh, I know may, maybe right they should now obtain the original plain text. Uh, or maybe yeah they should now have right or obtain. Um, right, original. Uh, right, original plain text. Um, all right, and I think probably they might want us to mention an encryption algorithm. Uh, so maybe right for encryption, uh, plain text will be encrypted with private key. Yeah, so I mean, all right, I think we can probably go and improve this. Uh, right, so for encryption, plain text will be encrypted with the private key. Uh, all right, let's say yeah, using. Um, you know, again, this is not the nesis, right? Let's say using encryption algorithm. Uh, who will decrypt with same private key? Or right, let's say, yeah, and same encryption. Uh, or right, let's say, well, and same, yeah, encryption decryption algorithm. Or right, let's call it decryption algorithm. Um, yeah, okay. All right, that, that should be fine. And I mean, you could also mention that the key will be generated. Uh, so maybe the same private key, uh, let's say, will be generated. Um, or let's say, yeah, generated using an algorithm. Um, and I mean, yeah, I would say, like, if you're not familiar with these, I mean, just go online and type in, like, symmetric encryption example. Um, and yeah, try to actually find, like, a symmetric encryption algorithm. You know, obviously just use that online, right, demo it. Um, same for asymmetric as well. So for symmetric, you know, a common one is gonna be AES, right, uh, maybe advanced encryption standard. Um, and let's say for asymmetric, you can look at RSA. Okay, so just you have a demo of these. I'll uh, type in like AES online, right, RSA online. Um, yeah, just to actually see how it works. Right, then we wanna give the purpose of encryption. So I think here we can just say to make the data uh, I mean, the, the word I want to use is like ununderstandable, and I did check, you know, that is actually a word. Um, so, uh, but I mean, I mean, yeah, let's use a different word because maybe ununderstandable seems like it's a fake word. Uh, so maybe to make the data, uh, I mean, let's just say, uh, I, mean, I don't know, you could say like unintelligible, that's also fine, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure how to spell that maybe something like that, uh, right? And honestly, I mean, th yeah, this handwriting is also unintelligible. Uh, right, so to make the data unintelligible, uh, let's say by a, uh, I don't know, maybe like malicious third party. Uh, right, let's say malicious third party um, who intercepts it. Uh, I, I guess we say, yeah, intercepts, right, slash accesses it. Uh, maybe accesses it, uh, yeah, without permission. All right, so yeah, that should be okay. Uh, you know, only one mark there. Right, binary is a base two number system. Give the name of the number system that's base 16. Uh, all right, so this should be hopefully quite easy, just hexadecimal. Um, of course, if they ask, you know, base 10, well, that's gonna be uh, denary. Right, three denary numbers are entered into a computer. The computer converts the numbers and stores them as binary. Right, give the binary numbers that will be stored for each of the denary numbers. Um, okay, so, I mean, I, I guess here, you know, we can write them as, I mean, well, this first one, we could just use four bits if we want, uh, but I think let's be consistent, let's use one byte. Um, yeah, although it doesn't tell us. Uh, right, so, I mean, if we think one byte, um, and I mean, again, if you want, of course, you can write out the numbers 
Um, and if we look right, since this is 201, you know, it doesn't tell us, but this must mean it's unsigned. Um, again, like assuming if we're only using one byte, because of course, if this is minus 128, well, then we wouldn't be able to get this 201. Um, so yeah, like because it doesn't tell us it's signed, it doesn't tell us we're using two's complement, um, and because we have this big number here, then you know we can probably assume it's going to be unsigned. Um, I mean, if if it's not, of course, we can just have leading zeros like this, right? That's also fine, uh, which yeah, I can demonstrate in a minute. Uh, right, so let's go 1028, 64, yeah, 32, 16, right, 8, 4, 2, and 1. Um, so if we look well, 10, uh, that's just going to be what, 8, uh, then. Yeah, obviously, well, no uh, no fours, right? There will be a two, there won't be a one. Um, and let's just pad that here with four leading zeros to make it one byte. Um, right, then if we want 50, well, 50 is going to be 32. Uh, right, it's also going to be 16. That's going to give us 48. Uh, then, of course, we want, what, no eights. Uh, yeah, we want no fours. We do want a two. Uh, and then, yeah, we don't want a one. Um, and again, let's just pad that with two zeros. Um, right, 201. So here, there'll be 128. Uh, right, there's also going to be 64, that'll get us to 192. Um, so then, of course, we just need 9. So, right, that's going to be no 32s, no 16s. Uh, there will be an 8, there won't be a 4, won't be a 2, there will be a 1. Um, and I would say, you know, if you do this in the exam, make sure just, just to check them quickly. Uh, so just add them up again, you know, 128 plus 64, right, that's 192. Uh, plus 8, right, that's 200. Yeah, plus 1, right, 201. Uh, right, explain why the data is converted to binary by the computer. Um, so what we want to say, and I think, I mean, this one is like a common answer. You can learn it from the mark schemes. Uh, you say, well, computers or digital devices, right, they're made using logic circuit or switches. And those logic circuit switches only have two states, uh, you know, obviously, well, on or off. Um, so basically, let's just say that. Uh, right, let's say, well, computers, uh, right, made or, yeah, comprised of logic circuits. Uh, right circuits, uh, right circuits, yeah, or switches. Um, so I think that should be one mark. Uh, right, let's say which can only have two states. Um, and then, well, let, let's just say for uh, zero, and that's going to be off. Uh, right, and let's say, yeah, or one, uh, which is kind of on. Right, and that, yeah, that should be enough for two marks. Uh, right, the binary integers this and that are added together. Add the binary integers using binary addition and show your answer in binary. All right, show all of your working. Right, okay, so first then let's just write these. Um, yeah, making sure hopefully not to make any uh, kind of writing errors. Um, and obviously, uh, yeah, that's not the best example. Um, you know, try to actually line up the zeros and ones, you know, each position or well, each column correctly. Right, so in order to add these, uh, I mean, well, hopefully, you know, you know, zero plus zero is zero, right? One plus one, right? Or zero plus one is going to be one. Uh, if we have one plus one, um, well, here, I mean, basically, that's two, right? So two is going to be one carry one. Um, and I think the way I like to demo this is, well, here, if we have one plus one, right? Again, well, the uh, basically here, the answer is, you know, one, one, right? Because uh, in denary, the answer one, one is two, right? Uh, okay, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay, yeah, one zero. Um, because obviously, well, one zero in binary is two. So what that means is we see, well, in this kind of right column, we get the answer zero. Right? But then in the sort of column to the left, well, that's where we get this carry of one. Now, likewise, we can extend that if we have, well, one plus one plus one, right? Well, obviously, that's going to be three. Now, in binary, three is going to be one one. So effectively, what we're saying uh, is we're saying, again, this rightmost column is now going to be one. Right, and then here also this leftmost column, right, this one, uh, we also have the carry of one. Um, yeah, I mean, that's just how that works, you know, a bit more formally. Uh, right, so well, zero plus zero, that's going to be zero. Zero plus one is one. Zero plus one is one. Uh, zero, zero, right, that's zero. Uh, right, one plus zero is going to be one. One plus one, right, again, that's where you get the zero. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be two, basically. Uh, so we get, yeah, a zero in this column. And then, of course, well, the, the one in this column. Um, because if we think about this, what this is, uh, C... Yeah, okay, this is 32, right? So 32 plus 32, right? That's going to be, well, 64, which, of course, is represented with this one. Uh, right, so then 1 plus 1, again, that's going to be 0, carry the 1. Uh, and then, yeah, this should be our final answer. Um, and again, of course, you know, you can check these by, yeah, adding them up, you know, making sure it makes sense. 
Uh, so if we think, well, this one in Denry, this is what, 128, 64, 32. Uh, right, so this is going to be 48. Um, this one is, uh, what, 64 plus 32, that's 96. Uh, plus 4, right, that's 100, that's going to be 102. Um, right, I mean, if we just add those up quickly, uh, what well, that's going to be, what, 150? Yeah, and then I guess here we have 128, uh, right, 128 plus 16, which is going to be 144. Um, yeah, that's plus 4, 148, right, plus 2, 150. Um, so again, you know, in the exam, I would suggest like double checking just like that. Uh, right, yeah, and I mean, yeah, okay. Um, I mean, like here it doesn't tell us that it's using two's complement because obviously if we're using two's complement, this would become negative. Um, but yeah, I think here we can just ignore that. Right, the denary integer minus 32 is stored as a two's complement integer. Uh, calculate the two's complement integer that would be stored. Right, so again, obviously here then we want, well, minus 128. Um, right, well, of course, yeah, then we've got 60, uh, yeah, I don't know, do I need to write this again, 64, 32, 16, all right, 8. Um, yeah, I mean, hopefully people are familiar with this now. Um, all right, so this one's actually not too difficult because, well, 32 is a power of 2. Uh, so what we can say, well, of course, we need the minus 128, right, then we have, we also have a 64, so this will now get us to minus 64, because, well, all right, minus 128 plus 64 is going to equal minus 64. All right, then we just have the 32. Um, so yeah, that gets us to minus 32, all right? And then of course we can just, uh, yeah, fill those with zeros. Um, yeah, and I, I was thinking, you know, usually they give us a space to write our answer. Um, so I don't know, like maybe we we just want to write this again, uh, you know, something like that, and uh, maybe just highlight it or something to show it's our answer. Uh, right, a student uses both system software and application software on their computer. Uh, right, give one example of system software. So, I mean, system software, there's actually only two examples, right? One of them was going to be the operating system. Um, and of course, here it says only one, but, you know, I'll mention both. Uh, right, operating system, and the other one was going to be utility software. Um, right, and I think, I mean, as mentioned, uh, let's say utility software. Right, I mean, as mentioned in the other video, uh, so, it, well, again, this is for paper 11, right, the, you know, the past, uh, yeah, the previous paper. Um, utility software, that's just going to be a software that kind of improves the performance of the computer um, or sort of, uh, I guess you can say, gives it like a smooth operation. Um, so part of utility, uh, well, let's say antivirus or anti-malware. Uh, you can also say things that are, you know, like disk defragmenters, uh, say like disk checkers, compression, or like file management, security management. Um, yeah, ju just things like this. Uh, I think you can you know, also like disk formatters. Um, right, so then we want to give two examples of application software, and this one's going to be easier um, because application software, you know, this is just user software. So, I mean, we can think like Office software, um, or maybe, maybe let's say like Office Suites. Uh, let's say, yeah, e.g., uh, I don't know, like spreadsheet. Um, yeah, like spreadsheet programs. Um, and I mean, the next one, you could say a game, you could say like a web browser. Um, yeah, I mean, just kind of anything you would like download and install, really. Uh, right, describe the difference between system software and application software. Um, Right, so I think system software, the definition they give is it can kind of, uh, let's say, like manage the hardware. Um, or you could say it's uh, kind of like an interface between the hardware and the uh, sort of, yeah, I mean, I guess between the hardware and the uh, software, or uh, we could also say, you know, uh, provides, a, uh, let's say, provides an interface for the user, um, you know, between the user and the hardware, effectively. Um, yeah, I mean, let's say, uh, all right, so system software. All right, let's say, well, system as system software. Um, right, is used, uh, I don't know, I mean, let's say to communicate with, um, right, communicate with and manage, uh, right, and manage the hardware. Um, yeah, I mean, let's try and extend that. Let's say, uh, all right, let, maybe it's right. It's an interface. 
um, yeah, let's say it's an interface between user, uh, right, user and hardware. Um, right, then application software, so uh, maybe application software, we can say it's kind of downloaded or installed by user. Uh, right, so application S, right, software uh, is downloaded. Um, right, and installed by user. Uh, yeah, and then let's say like to perform daily tasks. Um, yeah, and then to perform the sort of daily tasks uh, that they want to do or something. Uh, I don't know, yeah, maybe that user desires or user wants. Um, and again, of course, you know, here we actually have given examples. Uh, so, yeah, we could just mention that, right? E.g., yeah, office software, uh, you know, games, uh, yeah, web browsers, right, etc. Um, because I think sometimes it's actually difficult to explain things with like a general definition. But yeah, when you give specific examples, um, obviously what you're doing is you're showing to the examiner that you, uh, you can kind of actually, um, I mean, basically you're just showing that you understand what it means, right? Rather than giving some vague definition that the examiner is like, well, do they really understand? Whereas, yeah, when you give concrete examples, um, of course, yeah, you're, well, you're just showing that you understand. Uh, right, so five instructions are processed by a central processing unit, CPU, and a computer. Complete the paragraph about fetching an instruction into the CPU to be processed. And we want to use the terms from the list. Uh, some of the terms in the list will not be used. You should only use a term once. Right, so there's address or arithmetic logic unit. Um, and again, for these questions, I would recommend, you know, read all of the possible answers first. Uh, right, binary, control unit, current instruction register, right, data, denary, driver, fetch, interrupt. Uh, memory address register, memory data register, random access memory, read-only memory, secondary storage, and signal. Um, okay. So, I mean, let, let's just try and go through all of these quickly. Um, I mean, obviously, the address, well, this is just, you know, the location in RAM, or, yeah, the location in memory. Uh, the arithmetic logic unit, well, obviously, that's going to be the unit, right, the component uh, that does the arithmetic. Um, so, the arithmetic, well, addition, multiplication, division, you know, subtraction. Uh, right, also logic, so like and, or, not, XOR, right, all of those, yeah, logic gates. Um, well, obviously binary, we should know, I mean, control unit. So this is the thing, uh, it's gonna contain the current instruction register, right, also it contains the system clock. Um, yeah, basically it's gonna be the sort of brain of the CPU, it's gonna manage things. Um, it's gonna decode the instructions. Uh, it's gonna handle interrupts, okay, okay. Uh, it's gonna send out the signals to, you know, specific components. Um, so if you say like the CPU is kind of like managing the whole computer, but then the control unit is actually the thing that manages the CPU. Um, so yeah, I mean the control unit is really like the yeah sort of control of everything. Uh, I mean obviously data we should know. I mean denary yeah base ten um, driver. So we can say driver is going to be firmware right. So low level software that you know directly controls and communicates with hardware. Um, fetch so obviously while well, you know loading the instruction from memory. Um, Right, interrupt, so that's gonna be, uh, let's say if there's, uh, I don't know, maybe there's some error or some process ends, you know, something where the higher priority comes in. Um, then of course, you know, the current process can be stopped, right, interrupted, uh, yeah, the other thing can be handled. And then of course, when that's finished, um, you know, then the original sort of process can just resume executing. Uh, right, memory address register, so this will hold the address of the data. Um, yeah, okay, sorry, all right, well, let's say, yeah, this will hold the address uh, that data is about to be read from, right, or data is to be written to. So let's say if the memory address is, you know, 100, right, and then we have, uh, let's say, like an STO, right, so a store instruction. Um, so STO, right, that just means I kind of write data. Well, then it means that whatever data is in the NDR is then going to be written to the memory address 100, because, again, 100 is in the uh, MAR. Now, if, it, if alternatively, uh, alternatively we have like an LDD, right, so load using direct addressing, well, what that's going to do is it's, it's then going to load from address 100. All right, so uh, just to recap, like whatever, uh, whatever value is in the memory address register, well, that's going to be the address that's either, uh, well, either read from or written to, right, depending on what instruction we're actually performing. 
Um, and likewise, you know, the memory data register, well, this is going to be the data that's just been read from memory, right? All the data that's about to be written to memory. Um, we're obviously with random access memory, we should know, um, yeah, obviously, I don't know, maybe you've got like eight gigabytes of RAM, 16 gigabytes, 32, right, whatever. Uh, I mean, read-only memory ROM, obviously, we should know, again, you know, stores the BIOS, um, yeah, the bootloader. Uh, right, secondary storage, of course, that's going to be permanent storage, um, yeah, non-volatile. Uh, so non-volatile means when you turn off, it obviously doesn't get lost. Um, and I mean, signal, well, obviously, just like a, you know, electrical signal, electrical pulse. Um, right, so if we look at the question then, the program counter contains the something of the next instruction to be processed. Uh, right, so this should be address, yeah, which they have here. Um, and again, you know, this is why it's good to actually read them because, well, then we should sort of remember some of the possible answers they give us. Uh, right, this is then sent to the something using the address bus. Um, okay, so, yeah, I think what we want to say I mean, if, if we just read the next one, because uh, th this one's actually a bit tricky. Um, so the next one says, the address is then sent to the something. Right, okay, uh, and well, let's read the next one. Maybe read the whole thing just to get like an overview. Right, once the address is received, the instruction stored at the location is sent to the something, uh, right, using the something bus. Uh, the instruction is then sent to the something that is built into the, all right, something. Um, and yeah, all right, this is difficult, okay, seven marks. Um, Right, so let's read again, right? The uh, program count contains the address of the next instruction to be processed. Okay, that should be fine. Uh, right, this is then sent to the... Yeah, so I think here, you know, we can probably say MAR because, I mean, what happens, of course, while well, the instruction is in the program counter, it's then copied from the program counter into the MAR. Um, right, I mean, so I'm not... Uh, I mean, obviously, in the exam, you know, write the whole thing, but, I mean, here, I'm just going to write MAR. Um, right, this address is then sent to the, yeah, okay, something. Um, so I think here we can then say random access memory. Um, and the reason it's sent to RAM is because, well, again, like what we said is that uh, if the value 100 is in the MAR, uh, right, what you're going to do is, well, you're going to send that, uh, you're going to send this 100, right, to RAM, um, uh, you know, as well as a read signal. And then what RAM will do is, of course, RAM will check. Well, what's the you know what's the address that I want to read from? Uh, of course, here we well we've sent the value 100. So of course the RAM will then look right in memory address 100, and then obviously it's just going to return that data, um, which is then going to send you know by the data bus. Uh, right. Okay. So once the address is received, the instruction stored at the location is sent to the uh, right. So that's going to be MDR because again it you know it's copied from RAM in, into the MDR. Uh, right, and then because this is an instruction, it's going to be the data bus. Uh, right, the instruction is then sent to the something that is built into the something. Um, so if you remember, well, I mean, you know, just the whole stage of the fetch to code execute cycle. Uh, first, we have the instruction goes from the PC and into the MAR. Um, right, then what we say is, uh, we say, well, the, um, I mean, yeah, okay, basically this stage. Um, so we say, uh, let's say the address stored in the MAR, or, okay, I right, know, right, let's say the data stored in the address in the MAR is copied into the MDR. Um, and then this one's a bit difficult to explain because, you know, you've got kind of like two parts. Um, again, it's, it's not the address, right, it's, it's the data at the address. Um, and, you know, for A-level, they actually use this register transfer notation, which is, in my opinion, a bit, you know, maybe more simple. Um, because what, what we're saying here is we're saying, uh, well, one bracket is going to be the uh, the contents of the MAR. But then we're saying, well, the contents of the address, you know, stored in the MAR. Right? And then that's going to be copied into the MDR. Um, but again, you know, you don't need this notation for A. Uh, yeah, sorry, you don't need this to, uh, notation for IG. Um, right, so of course, right, this is then going to go to the MDR. Right, and then we just say, well, the contents of the MDR are then copied into the CIR, right, the current instruction register. Um, so let's go CIR, and I think as mentioned, the CIR, well, that's built into the control unit. Um, and again, you know, I would also recommend uh, check paper one, right, or paper 11, because, yeah, they also had a question where basically you had to draw this. Um, so, you know, it's good to also see how, like, how they've drawn it in the mark scheme too. Right, then it says the CPU uses an instruction set to decode the instruction, state what is meant by an instruction set. 
Um, all right, so an instruction set, I mean, that's just a list of all the instructions. So for example, you know, for Cambridge, well, they have add, uh, which obviously addition. Uh, they have, you know, let's say LDM, right? That's loading an immediate value. So if you do something like LDM five, well, that will load the, uh, yeah, that will load the denary number five, right, into the, um, well, into the accumulator. Right, and then you can also have, let's say, LDD. And let's say if we do LDD five, well, this means uh, load, uh, okay, well, basically, well, load the contents of address five, right, into the accumulator. Um, of course, you also got like STO, right, store. So here we're just storing the contents of the accumulator right into address five. Um, and I, I might actually show you this, but let's see if you have the assembly website. Uh, and again, this is what asmcode.pro. Um, right then here, you can actually see the instruction set, right? And this is gonna be the instruction set of Cambridge. Um, yeah, all of these. Uh, in fact, actually some of these jumps are actually just additional ones. Um, and you know, of course here you can see some examples and things as well. Um, so yeah, if, if anyone does wanna practice assembly, uh, again, the website here, uh, right, asmcode.pro, um, similar to pseudocode.pro. Um, right, so I mean, let, let's just explain that then. So we can just say, um, I don't know, maybe the full list. Um, right, the full list of, and let's say machine code instructions. Um, I don't know, like let's say that the processor can support. Uh, yeah, or let's say uh, that the CPU can execute. I guess that should be fine. Um, yeah, okay, I think that's that's fine. Right, six, the table contains statements about error detection methods. Complete the table by giving the correct error detection method for each statement. Right, so first we've got an odd or even process can be used. Uh, so this is gonna be what parity. Um, yeah, I mean, we could call it what parity check. I mean, maybe parity bit. Uh, I think maybe parity check should be okay in this case. Uh, right, a value is calculated from the data using an algorithm. This happens before and after the data is transmitted. Right, so if they're talking about a value, um, and yeah, and, and I mean, so th this one is actually similar to number five here. Um, so, I mean, this one is, well, yeah, I mean, th this one is going to be checksum. Now, you might also think check digit, but of course, check digit, it should just really say what well, a digit is calculated from the data, right? Just, you know, one digit. Um, whereas, of course, when it says value, well, this can be like a, you know, long number, string, or something like that. Um, and of course, the, the way this works is, well, the, uh, right, the sender will calculate the checksum. Um, they'll then send the data and the checksum. Right, the receiver will then take the original, uh, well, okay, yeah, the receiver will take the data they received, right, they'll also calculate the checksum, and they'll check that, you know, does, well, does the checksum they calculated, right, equal the checksum that the receiver sent? And of course, if it does, well, they can assume that there's been no, you know, data transmission error. Um, of course, if it doesn't, well, yeah, then something has gone wrong, right, there's been some corruption or something. Um, they can probably, you know, download it again. They can uh, yeah, ask for it to be retransmitted. Um, and to be honest, right, on a, on a lot of websites, you know, when you want to download a file, uh, you'll often see something, uh, maybe like the MD5 hash. Uh, I mean, that's, you know, I guess old. It's not as secure now. Uh, also like SHA256. Um, and I mean, yeah, when, when you go to a software website, uh, you know, try and actually look out for these because it, it will often have them, you know, under the download button. Um, and, and again, the I mean, the reason they have that is just to verify that, you know, your download has not been corrupted. Uh, yeah, to verify that, you know, you've not downloaded a malicious file like a Trojan, all right, by mistake. Um, right, a copy of the data is sent back to the sender by the receiver. Um, right, so this then is just gonna be echo check. Um, and again, you know, hopefully you know how an echo check works, but of course, well, let's say A sends to B, uh, right, they send the data, let's say one, two, three. Um, yeah, B then sends that data back, one, two, three. Um, and of course, what well, A is the one that's going to do the check. So A checks, well, is, you know, what it received equal uh, to the data it sent? And of course, if they're equal, well, then it knows, yeah, there's, you know, probably been no mistake. Uh, right, next one, acknowledgement and timeouts are used. Uh, right, I guess, um, let's try and write this. So what well, automatic repeat request. Um, right, well, yeah, if we want the short name, just what ARQ, I'll write the abbreviation. Um, and you know, the, the way this works is more difficult, but let's say we've got A and B again. 
So well, A is going to send to B. Now, let's say if B receives it, well, then it's just going to respond, you know, with a positive acknowledgement saying it received it. Uh, let's say if B doesn't receive it, well, then of course there, there's going to be no like positive acknowledgement. So what A will do is what well, A can then you know try to send it again. Um, of course, then it can like send it again. So let's say A sends it three times and it never gets a positive acknowledgement. Um, yeah, or I mean, so again, I mean, it could be a tie. Uh, I mean, it could be like a number of tries, like three tie, uh, three tries. Um, yeah, or it could be a time. So it could send, and if it hasn't received after I don't know one second or two seconds, um, right? Then it will like assume there's some sort of error. And if there's an error, of course, well then it can just stop. Um, but again, what it's going to do well, is it's going to try to send. Uh, right, if B receives it, then it will send a positive acknowledgement saying it's received it. Uh, and then, of course, you know, A can then send, you know, sort of the second lot of data. Um, yeah, however, if B doesn't respond, well, then A is just going to send, you know, the first lot of data again. Um, of course, wait for B to respond. If B doesn't respond again, well, it's going to send the first lot of data again. Um, of course, it will do this, I don't know, like three times, five times, whatever. Um, and yeah, if, if it still doesn't receive, well, then it can just stop because, yeah, obviously there's... I don't know, maybe B is unreachable for some reason. Uh, right, then the last one, a value is appended to the data that has been calculated using the data. This value is checked on data entry. Um, right, I mean, so when it just says appended, you know, obviously appended means at the end. Uh, if it says prepended, well, prepended means, you know, at the beginning. Um, so, for example, you know, often a, a parity bit might be prepended because they often write that at the start. Um, whereas this one, well, this is going to be a check digit. Um, and also, yeah, check digit usually is going to be appended at the end, uh, if you think of like an ISBN number. Um, and I mean, if you don't know ISBN, right, that's just like the book ID. Uh, yeah, you can practice trying to calculate this. Um, I think also a credit card number, the last digit of a credit card number, um, that's also a check digit. And the way that works uh, is something called the LUN algorithm. Um, and actually, well, this learn algorithm is uh, basically it works the same as the ISBN, um, you know, just slightly different numbers, I think. Uh, but yeah, the process is the same. Uh, right, a computer has a media access control or MAC address and internet protocol IP address. Right, tick one box to show which of the statements is correct about the MAC address. Um, right, so it's assigned by the manufacturer. Yeah, I mean, so this one is just going to be true. Um, but I mean, let's read the others just in case. Right, it's assigned by a router. Um, no, I mean, so, well, this is going to be IP address, and I mean, in particular, the way this works, right, is using the DHCP server. Um, so DHCP, right, are dynamic host control protocol. Um, and I mean, what, what this does is, well, basically, it will store a list of IP addresses. Uh, so I don't know, let's say you're on a network like uh, 192, uh, let's say dot one six eight, uh, let's say dot zero, and let's say our subnet mask is, uh, well, 255, 255. Uh, right, 255 and 0. So what this means is it means, well, these first 24 bits are going to be the network. Uh, right, these last 8 bits, this is going to be the device. So effectively what we're saying is, uh, well, this 192.168.0, um, this is going to be the network part, right, and then it's only going to be these last, you know, 8 bits that are going to be the actual IP address. Um, so let's say, for example, we've got, you know, I don't know, the address 1, 2, 3, right, etc. Uh, maybe up to sort of 255 or yeah, maybe two, uh, let's say 254 um, because I think 255 is kind of reserved, right? It's used for something else. Uh, same with zero, right? Possibly one as well, right? Possibly you can't use these. Uh, yeah, although I think one should be okay actually. Um, so what it's going to do is it's just going to say, well, is this, you know, device in use? Or yes, yeah, sorry, is this IP address in use? And like maybe here it might store the MAC address or something, you know, of the device that's using it. Um, so let's say, you know, this one is being used, this one is being used, this one is being used. But then when it gets to four, we're obviously unused. Um, so then, of course, the DHCP server will just, you know, give the IP, uh, it will just give this IP address, like, to that device. Um, and, I mean, yeah, what it will do, it will give it to that device just for a limited number of time, maybe, like, eight hours, for example. Um, and, yes, yeah, sometimes they do actually ask this. And what they'll ask is, well, how does the... Uh, I don't know, maybe how do they like renew the IP address? So let's say the DHCP, or I, I guess the question would be, yeah, how does DHCP work? Um, or how does DHCP like assign and then, you know, renew the IP address? So let's say first they give it to the uh, device for eight hours. 
what's going to happen, the device will wait half of that time. Okay, so the device is going to wait four hours. And after four hours, it's going to, uh, well, I mean, this is like assuming the device is still turned on. Well, obviously, if it's turned off, it's fine. You don't need the IP anymore. Um, but let's say right, if after four hours, uh, you're still using this IP, well, then the device will then go to the DHCP server again, right? So effectively going to the router and it will say, you know, can I continue using this IP address? Um, let's say if the, I mean, if the DHCP server says yes, right, of course, then it's just going to extend it. I don't know, maybe another four hours or another eight hours, right? Who knows? Um, I mean, yeah, th this depends on the settings, right? You can actually change these settings in the router. Um, I think this will be called the least time, right? And, uh, you know, you can also see this in your Windows, uh, yeah, I think if you run like IP conflicts, uh, sorry, your IP conflicts slash all, um, just run that in command prompt, it will actually tell you the least time or how much time you've got remaining. Um, but I mean, let, let's assume for some reason, maybe the router is unreachable. So we've tried to ask, you know, can we extend by another four hours? Uh, the router is unreachable. So then what we're gonna do, we're gonna wait half the time again. And you know, now the current least time is four hours. So effectively then, uh, you know, then we're gonna just wait two hours. Right, then after two hours again, we're going to say, well, can we continue using uh, this IP address right, by asking the DHCP? Um, of course, if the DHCP says yes, I don't know, maybe again, it's going to extend by four hours or eight hours or you know, two hours, right? who knows? Um, obviously, again, if it's unreachable again, well, then it's going to one hour and wait, right? then 30 minutes, 15, you know, 7.5. Um, so it's going to keep halving. And obviously, well, if, the, if the thing just expires, uh, yeah, then you're obviously not going to have the IP address anymore. Um, right, I mean, so the next one was static or dynamic. Um, I mean, static, obviously, that's going to be a fixed IP address. Uh, I mean, yeah, th this one, you can change it, but basically, it's not going to change, like, unless you physically kind of change it yourself. Um, whereas, you know, obviously, dynamic, well, this, again, because dynamic is assigned by the DHCP, uh, so, right, dynamic host control protocol server, um, you know, this one can change kind of automatically. Um, because I don't know, maybe this says like, well, no, you can't use this IP address anymore. Um, or for, ex for example, this will change like when you turn the device off, because next time you turn the device on, well, let's say now someone that is actually using this, you know, IP like four. Um, so then of course you would need to use, you know, for number five or something. Um, whereas static is going to be the same even after you turn it off, right? When you turn it on again, uh, it's still the same. Um, right, made up of three different parts. Well, yeah, that's going to be no. Um, I mean, we can say a MAC address is going to be two different parts, right? The um, let's do an example, maybe FF. Uh, and I mean, yeah, this one you can write either with colons, right? Or you could use hyphens as well. Uh, I don't know. Let's say like A seven. Uh, let's say four eight. Uh, let's say I don't know, like nine two. Um, right, something like that. So what you say then is the first six. Uh, let's say the first six hexadecimal digits or characters. Um, they're going to be assigned by the manufacturer. Um, so yeah, that like these will be the same. You know, uh, let's say if you've got a, uh, I don't know, like TP Link, or if you've got some, you know, Apple device, whatever it is. Um, yeah, that can be the same. You know, for that manufacturer. Um, but then you know these last six, they're going to be unique for your particular device. Um, and I mean, like th this won't. Uh, for example, these first six, uh, let's say a company like Apple. Right or yeah, I know TP Link or like uh, Linksys or you know some router, you know most of them don't just have one kind of uh, six-digit code. Um, you know these big companies they would have like maybe I don't know 10, 20, 100 right different codes, um, which yeah they're going to sort of correspond to our uh, different models, you know stuff like that. Um, but again, the, you know the first or well, the key point is uh, the first six are assigned by the manufacturer, right? The last six are going to be unique for your device. Um, but again, I mean, they're also kind of assigned, you know, during production, right? Because whereas an IP address, this will change. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the MAC address won't change, you know, once the device has been created. Right, the next one, the IP address can have IP version six, uh, sorry, yeah, IP version four or version six format. Uh, give an example of an IP address that has an IP version four format. Right, so here then, what we think, uh, we just want to have four groups of uh, denary digits in the range of 0 to 255. Um, so for example, I mean, I don't know, let's, well again, let's just go like 192, uh, let's go 168, um, and then here we can just go what, 0 0.255. Um, so yeah, of course, this would be valid. Now, to be honest, for me, like I probably wouldn't use 0 and 255 in the exam, because obviously that, that's like the boundary data. 
um, yeah, I would probably go something more simple, you know, just, I don't know, 100, right, dot 110, uh, yeah, dot 120, right, dot 130. Um, yeah, just something simple like that. Uh, right, give two characteristics of uh, the IP version 6 format. And I mean, j just quickly, actually, um, sometimes they might ask you, and yeah, I think maybe this is more for A level, uh, they might ask you, right, how can you determine if an IP address is public or private? And for example, they'll give you like, I, I don't know, maybe, uh, I, I don't know, maybe this is like 120 or something. Um, and they say, you know, which of these is a public IP address, which of these is a, a private IP address. And you might know that, uh, let's say an IP address that starts with a 192.168, right, this is going to be private. Um, and yeah, possibly the zero as well. I'm, I'm not sure what the subnet mask is. Uh, I, th I think just 192.168, right. Uh, anything starting with this is going to be a private IP address. So of course that would mean this like 120, 110, 120, 130, right? This would be the public. Um, and then, you know, another common one you might see a lot, right? 127 dot uh, something like this, right? So here, this is, I mean, well, this is just your local IP address. Um, so whereas your private is, you know, just on your network, right? For your router, uh, well, local literally just means, you know, your computer, right? Your specific device. Um, and yeah, no one outside can access that. Uh, right, then if we want to say two characteristics of IP version 6. Uh, right, so let's think, well, this is going to be 128 bits. Um, yes, yeah, so what that's going to be uh, 16 bytes, I think. Um, yeah, maybe. Uh, right, so well, it's going to be 128 bits. And what we can say, that's going to be in eight groups of four. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, let, let's just write that here. Uh, right, let's say eight groups, uh, right, of four, and this would be hexadecimal. Uh, right, let's say eight groups of four hexadecimal digits, right, or characters. Um, yeah, that should be fine. And then, you know, if you want to talk about other ones, you can also say, well, they're separated by a colon, like this. Um, whereas, of course, you know, IP version four right, is separated by the dot or the period. Um, you can probably also say, yeah, I mean, you could mention something like uh, if you have, you know, repeated groups of zeros, um, well, they can be compressed. Um, so let's say you have something like, uh, I don't know, maybe AAA. Uh, right, so let's say four A's, and well, let's imagine, you know, these are all zeros here, uh, let's just say like, it's all B's at the end. Um, so in this case, well, because we want to have eight groups in total, right, of course, there's going to be six groups of zeros here. Now, the way we can simplify that, we can just go, uh, well, we just want to write these A's, uh, right? Then we just do this double colon, right? And then we then we just go B's like this. Um, so what this is saying is, well, everything between here, you know, it's just all zeros. However, you do have to be careful of this and you have to think, well, you can only use this one time uh, for each IP address because let's imagine you have something like, uh, I don't know, let's just do it quickly. Um, so we've got sort of, yeah, zeros. Uh, I'm just going to do dots just to sort of simplify it. Let's go Bs. Uh, right, let's say some more zeros. Uh, then let's go Cs like this. Now, we couldn't do something like, again, I'm just going to do it quick. We couldn't do like As, right? Then uh, let's say this double colon, uh, right? B, uh, yeah, I guess well, we've got some zeros. And then uh, let's say double colon, right? And then C. Because like you would think, well, I mean, here we've obviously got three groups, right? So A, B, C. Um, and of course, remember, this is like A, A, uh, yeah, four A's, right? This is four B's, this is four C's. Um, because like we wouldn't know, well, is there sort of one group of zeros here and then four groups of zeros here? Or yeah, is it, uh, I don't know, maybe two groups of zeros here? Um, and what that would be, you know, three groups of zeros here, right? Obviously, uh, yeah, we wouldn't know how it's split. Um, so that's why we can only use this thing once, right, for each IP address. <clears throat> uh, right, then a company has a website that is suffering a distributed denial of service attack or DDoS. Uh, draw an annotated diagram to show the process of the DDoS. Right, okay, so let's say here then we've got our, uh, I guess let's just say web server. Um, or does it say, yeah, okay, website. All right, so let's just go, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I should have drawn this bigger. All right, let's go web server. Um, right, then what we, yeah, I mean, maybe I should have drawn this down a little bit. Because uh, I, I sort of want to do the botnet at the top, to be honest. Um, so, in fact, I mean, let, let's just draw this first. So, we're going to, uh, this is going to be the, I mean, I'm, you can call it like, you know, hacker, malicious third party, right? The botnet controller. Um, 
I mean, let's go unnamed malicious third party. Um, right, so they're then going to have a botnet. And what a botnet means is basically, uh, I mean, I know maybe let's call it B1, right, B2. So yeah, bot1, bot2, right, bot3. Uh, and let's just, let's just do four of them. Um, so what a botnet is, is basically, uh, well, they're just going to be devices that are controlled by this other person. So for example, they can issue commands to these computers and or, you know, devices, right? It could be a phone, it could be a, you know, fridge, a car or anything. Um, so they can issue commands to these devices and, you know, these devices will then execute those commands. Um, so right, let, let's just sort of have these connected. Uh, and, and maybe here, let's just sort of do like a dashed line or dotted line. Um, and we'll just label this as the botnet. Um, right, and then what, what's going to happen then? These are then going to send, uh, we can say send requests, right, to the web server. Uh, right, so this is going to be our web server. Um, and then here we can also have like a legitimate user. Uh, yeah, I think I don't really have enough room to write this. Right, let's say legit user. Um, so what's going to happen is, well, the malicious third party will issue a command. Uh, so may maybe let's just sort of draw here, right, one. Uh, right, let's say malicious, right, third party, uh, right, issues command. Uh, let's say, right, CMD, uh, four bots. Uh, right, two, let's say mass send request. Uh, right to mass send requests uh, to web server. Um, right, okay. Uh, and I, I guess we could say maybe two simultaneously. Right, so let's say, yeah, two simultaneously mass send requests to web server. <clears throat> um, I mean, obviously the, the second step as well, the botnets are then gonna send those requests. Uh, yeah, I mean, so maybe we can just do this. Um, I don't know, yeah, bots start sending requests. Uh, yeah, requests. Um, right, so then three, well, what's going to happen? You know, the server is going to be, because you think, I mean, let's say each bot, uh, I don't know, maybe this can send like a thousand requests per second. And maybe we've got, you know, ten, hundreds, or even thousands of botnets. So this server is going to be getting like millions of requests per second, you know, or billions potentially. Um, so right, let's say, uh, yeah, web server. Uh, let's say, right, tries to handle. Um, yeah, huge number, um, right, of, uh, I don't know, maybe like, yeah, let's say of illegitimate botnet requests. Uh, right, illegitimate, uh, right, yeah, botnet requests. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know, maybe say a bot becomes overwhelmed. Because uh, I don't know. I mean, let's say our server can handle like a hundred. Uh, let's say a hundred requests per second. Um, obviously, this depends on what type of request it is. You know, if it's a database request, it's going to be slower, right? So of course, we can handle less. Uh, if it's simply like requesting a simple file or you know the home page, um, you know, we should be able to handle thousands of requests per second. Um, but yeah, so right, handle a huge number of illegitimate botnet requests, uh, but becomes uh, yeah, let's say overwhelmed. Um, right, and then four, what we can say, and let's just go down here. Uh, right, we can say, well, this means the legitimate user. Uh, I mean, let's just say hence. And, you know, I think in the exam, you can use more detail um, because, honestly, your writing is going to be smaller. You know, trying to write with a tablet right on this screen. Uh, obviously, yeah, my handwriting becomes quite big. Um, so it's, it's difficult to actually write, you know, uh, yet to sort of use all the space here. Uh, right, so hence, right, let's say legit user, let's say LU. Um, or let's say their request uh, maybe is unable to be handled. Uh, yeah, okay, right, be handled. Um, I think that's fine. And well, let's read the question again, make sure we've got everything. Yeah, okay, so I think that should be fine. Right, then we want to identify a solution that can be used to help prevent the DDoS attack uh, being successful. So I mean, I think here really the, the main one is just going to be a firewall. And the reason you'd use a firewall is because, well, let's say, uh, I mean, obviously a firewall is going to be in front of the web server. 
Um, so I'm just going to sort of draw it as a box around it. It's kind of protecting. It's like a shield, right? Uh, so obviously any request that comes in, well, that request is going to be inspected. And let's say, uh, obviously, well, these bots are going to have an IP address. Now, if it sees that, you know, this particular IP address is sending like a thousand requests per second, like maybe it will let them send, I don't know, five requests per second. But then, you know, the next like 995 is just going to block. Um, and of course, if it's sort of detected that it's sending millions upon millions, right, it's just going to block it completely. Um, you know, if your firewall is good. Um, so that, that means that, you know, the web server won't become like overwhelmed with requests. Um, and then, of course, the legitimate user should still be, uh, be able to access the web server um, because, again, you know, the web server is not going to be overwhelmed. Um, yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Right, nine, a company uses both solid state and optical secondary storage. Uh, explain why a computer needs secondary storage. Right, okay, so secondary storage, I mean, obviously it's going to be permanent storage, uh, well, permanent, non-volatile, so when you turn off the computer, you know, the data stays. Um, so yeah, I guess we can say that, right? And obviously it can be used to store their programs, their data. Um, yeah, so let, let's say that. Uh, all right, let's say to provide. Um, let's say permanent. Uh, right, let's, also, well, let's say permanent slash non-volatile. Uh, right, let, let's in practice, let's explain that. So non-volatile means uh, data won't be lost. Uh, right, data won't be lost when power is turned off. Um, all right, and, you know, this is in contrast, for example, to RAM. All right, so RAM would be volatile because, of course, when you turn off the computer, right, everything in RAM is just lost. Right, so you should provide permanent non-volatile uh, storage um, yeah, I mean, let's say, well, to store their programs, right, files, etc. Uh, right, programs. Uh, yeah, let's say files, um, obviously data. Um, you know, I think data and files, they're kind of the same thing, but yeah, maybe there's a slight difference. Right, so describe three differences between solid state and optical storage. Right, so I mean, let, let's try and start with maybe just uh, the, yeah, I don't know, I mean, maybe we can start with how they work, I guess. Um, then we can talk about more of the things like price and, yeah, sort of, you know, capacity. Um, right, so solid state, uh, I mean, let's just write this, right, solid state. Uh, right, this is going to use transistors. Uh, right, transistors, um, or I, I guess we could say, right, gates. Uh, I mean, right, let's say gates, uh, right, let's say, and yeah, if we want to be more specific, uh, let's say, right, control and floating gates. Uh, right, control and floating gates uh, comprised of transistors. Uh, right, transistors, yeah, to store data. Um, right, then we'll say uh, optical, right, so optical, that can use pits and LANs. Uh, right, uses, yeah, pits, uh, right, and LANs. Um, yeah, or we can say like a, uh, I don't know, maybe chemical coating, I guess that can be how we can say it. Uh, right, chemical coating, uh, yeah, to store data. Okay, so let's quickly just try and explain how these SSDs or solid state drives work. Um, we see here then, uh, well, this floating gate, and yeah, can I draw? Okay, uh, so th this floating gate that we see here, right, this blue one, uh, this is effectively what represents, you know, the bit as being zero or one. Now, I think probably if it's negatively charged, so we can see here, right, it's, it's negatively charged. Uh, let's say negatively charged equals one. Right, unless if there's you know no charge, uh, right, that's just going to be zero. Um, of course, it could be the other way around. You know, it doesn't really matter. Um, and then we see here the control gate is just empty. Now, let's say we actually want to remove the charge from this floating gate. What we can do is we can actually charge this control gate, or yeah, we can negatively charge this control gate, and of course that's then going to repel the electrons uh, from this floating gate. Uh, you know, into this. Uh, I think it's like some oxide something. Um, yeah, I think the science is not really important.
Uh, but you know, it's just going to repel them away. And then, of course, eventually, what's going to happen is, well, then you know, the control gate is obviously going to have these minus charges, um, and obviously, the the floating gate is then just going to be neutral, right? There's going to be no charge. So that's how we can sort of detect the difference between a zero or one. Um, again, if the floating gate is negative, right, then it's going to be a one. Uh, let's say, like here, if the floating gate is neutral, right, then it's going to be a zero. Um, and of course, yeah, the way we can do that is just by negatively charging the control gate, uh, which is then going to repel the electrons, you know, from the floating gate, um, yeah, down into uh, this kind of oxide layer right down here. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, I mean, if, if we just want to contrast that, let's say with like a uh, what optical storage, so CD, DVD, Blu-ray, really there's two ways they can work. I mean, one is going to be, uh, well, pits and lands, or maybe we say lands and pits. Um, so let's say a land, well, a land is going to be, you know, the, well, the high one, uh, right? A pit is then going to be, you know, the, well, the low one, right? The kind of hole, basically. Um, so yeah, I mean, let, let's draw something like this. And let's say that, uh, I don't know, maybe this distance is like one bit. Um, so actually here, well, here we've kind of got two bits, right? Because it's like twice the distance. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe this is one bit because, you know, obviously this, this diagram is not that accurate, right? Maybe this is another one, right? Another one, yeah, another one. Um, so what we can say, like, I don't know, maybe the land represents a one. And then I think technically what they say is that uh, it's not necessarily that like a land represents one, a pit represents zero. It's that... Uh, is that basically while well, the bits will stay the same until we change from either a land to a pit or a pit to a land. Um, so of course, well, here we get a one, right? And I, I do notice that this will actually be, you know, well, pits will be zero, lands will be one. But uh, yeah, I mean, if we just go through this process, you know, when it changes, so here it changes, as that means this one is gonna be a zero, okay? But then it stays the same. So that means again, we get another zero. Uh, now we change back to a land, okay? So of course we get a one, all right, then we change to a pit, all right, it's obviously zero, one, zero, uh, yeah, obviously, etc. Um, and, you know, the, the way it works, of course, is, well, uh, you're going to have a laser right, or a light. Uh, when the light hits the land, it's going to be reflected. Uh, when the land hits the pit, right, th well, this means it won't be reflected. Um, because, yeah, this is going to be sort of like dull, it's, yeah, it's obviously deeper, it's not going to be reflected. Um, so, yeah, that's how I can, you know, distinguish. Right, and then another type is where you'd use a chemical, and basically the chemical is, uh, I think they call it like amorphous or non-amorphous. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if that's the correct spelling, uh, something like this maybe. Uh, yeah, amorph, uh, maybe amorphous. Um, but I mean, what, what this is saying is like, uh, they would use a different intensity laser to change the chemical properties um, yeah, of the, I guess, elements, you know, on the actual, like, coating. Um, so let's say we have some, uh, this is just like the atoms. Now, let's say we use a certain frequency laser and it causes the atoms to, you know, arrange themselves in a nice, uh, you know, like, lattice sort of structure like this. So I guess here, you know, when they're, like, close together, when they're, uh, yeah, I don't know, when they're just, like, nicely arranged like this, uh, this means it's going to be shiny. So, of course, when we shine the laser onto this part where well, it's going to be reflected, um, I guess if we use a different frequency laser, uh, yeah, it means, uh, I don't know, you know, the atoms are going to be arranged slightly differently. Um, and, of course, this now is going to be, like, non-shiny. Um, so, of course, when, you know, when the laser is reflected onto this, well, obviously, it's not going to reflect back. And, again, this is how we distinguish between, you know, a 1 and a 0. Um, and again, you know, this is probably not the best diagram because it seems like it's, you know, more dense and less dense. But yeah, I think if you just search like amorphous, non-amorphous, right, you can probably see a better, you know, better diagram, right, rather than just what I've drawn. Um, right, but I mean, let, let's say, I hope you just want some more simple ones. Uh, let's go SSDs or solid state. Uh, right, so solid state, this is going to be more expensive. Um, and I think we don't just want to say more expensive because obviously if you're talking like, you know, a 50 gigabyte Blu-ray versus a one terabyte SSD, well, of course the SSD is going to be more expensive. Um, so we want to say, right, more expensive, like per, well, let's say per unit storage, uh, or let's say per gigabyte or gibibyte. Um, and then, well, we can also mention the speed. So let's go SS, right, is faster. Um, or let's do our faster to access. Uh, yeah, maybe let's go access data. Um, and then in brackets, we can just go, what, like, read and write. 
Um, okay, and then, oh yeah, still a few more questions. Uh, Rice of 10, a garage uses an expert system to help diagnose any problems with cars that need repair. The expert system is an example of artificial intelligence. Right, describe what is meant by AI. Uh, so AI, let's go, that's gonna be a system that, uh, let's say, demonstrates human-like intelligence. Um, yeah, so let's say, uh, and maybe like a non-biological or like a digital system. Uh, I mean, let's say digital, uh, or let's say a digital system. Um, yeah, that develop, uh, or let, or let's say that demonstrates, um, or let's say human-like, uh, right, human-like intelligence. Um, and let's say, for example, uh, right, let's say, well, logic, uh, well, I guess we can say, yeah, logic and reasoning. Um, I guess we can say uh, maybe linguistics or languages. Uh, and maybe language ability, right, linguistic ability. Um, yeah, I mean, we could, we could mention sort of like mathematical ability. Uh, I think one they say is kind of awareness. So, you know, awareness of its surroundings. Um, or let's say, yeah, AI, uh, right, AI may also, uh, because, you know, some will, some won't. All right, may also uh, maybe have, I guess, you yeah, have the ability to learn. Um, so obviously this would be like machine learning, right? Machine learning would be a subset of AI that obviously has the ability to learn right, and improve its performance. Uh, okay, and again, yeah, just kind of shorthand. Right, a car has a problem with its braking system, so it's brought to the garage. Explain how the expert system operates and how it's used to help diagnose the problem. Right, so here, I, I guess, I mean, what we'd have, uh, well, of course, first you're gonna have the user interface. All right, let's go UI. Um, this user interface, well, I mean, let, let's think of the three things. Right, so we're gonna have the knowledge base, the rules base, and the inference engine. Um, so we say, well, this can sort of go to the inference engine, right, the IE. Um, and then the IE is gonna use the knowledge base, uh, right, let's say, well, the knowledge base, right, and rules base. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe we can sort of connect them together. Um, and yeah, I, I don't know, we can sort of draw a line back. I mean, this is probably not the best diagram. Um, and of course, that's gonna go back to the UI. So what we're saying, and yeah, we can have a person here or like the car or something. Um, so, I mean, I mean, the person is just gonna, you know, type in some details about the car, right? And like, uh, I guess there'll probably be questions, um, I don't know, yeah, questions about, you know, specific features of the engine or, you know, what's gone wrong, right? What's happening? Uh, yeah, like various, you know, technical car questions. Um, you know, of course the user can then type in the answers to that. And what the inference engine will do is it will then use the knowledge base and the rules base in order to, let's say, give suggestions. Because, uh, I don't know, like let's say the, uh, I mean, let's say in the knowledge base, the typical car engine might be, um, I, mean, I don't know, like maybe this is completely wrong, right? Let's say 10,000 revs per minute. Yeah, maybe that's way too high, maybe it's way too low. Uh, yeah, I don't really know about cars. Uh, but let's say, for example, like a typical value should be 10,000 revs per minute or a typical like oil pressure or, you know, whatever other car features, right? Is it, uh, again, it's going to have a list of all of these typical values. Um, but let's say, for example, you know, if from our test, the actual real revs per minute is only 2,000, well, then, of course, it's going to know, right, this is too low. So it can then use the rule space to think, well, like if the revs per minute is too low, like what are some possible causes? Um, and then, of course, it can suggest some possible causes based on that. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that's really what we want to try and explain. Um, yeah, okay, so let's say maybe a user. Uh, yeah, or let's say a user will be asked questions about the car. All right, like, yeah, ask questions about car. Uh, right, let's say, yeah, via, uh, right, well, let's say ask questions, uh, let's say from rules base, because yeah, these questions will come from the rules base. Um, and let's say, right, via the user interface, um, because again, the user interface will be like the screen, the keyboard, right, whatever they're using to interact. Um, yeah, let's say about, uh, yeah, right, we said that. 
Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, let's say maybe user types in their answer, or yeah, user inputs answer. Um, right, let's say user inputs answers two questions. Um, right, and let's say, uh, yeah, maybe add the inference engine. Uh, right, let's say inference engine. Uh, let's say compares values to the expected values in the knowledge base. Uh, right, compare values uh, to yeah, expected values, uh, right, in knowledge base. Um, yeah, and let's say, right, and can ask, uh, right, let's say can ask uh, maybe follow-up questions. Uh, right, so follow-up questions from rules base. Um, because again, we've said, like, let's say if the revs per minute is too low, well, then it can ask, you know, did you check the, uh, I don't know, the engine, whatever, like something wrong with the engine. Um, but let's say, like, if the revs per minute is, you know, 20,000, well, then, of course, it's going to suggest something else, right? Because obviously it's too high. Um, so, yeah, that's why it's going to need, obviously, well, the user input is going to need the knowledge base to know the expected values. Uh, it's going to need the rules base to determine, you know, what follow-up question to ask. Uh, right, so you can ask follow-up questions from rules base. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, let's say, yeah, this process continues. Uh, right, let's say continues, yeah, until... Uh, the inference engine, right, i.e., uh, can suggest, um, well, let's say the solution, all right, yeah, with like reasonable certainty. Um, yeah, and I think that should be fine. And, you know, we can also say the inference engine can also give a, uh, it can also give like a, uh, let's say probability that this is you know the correct error so you can say yeah like with 80 percent probability um you know the error is yeah i mean this particular thing with the engine um so we, we could mention that and you know really this is also like an explanation system um so i don't know yeah maybe may use explanation system um so what this will do is uh, let's say well to explain why uh, to explain why, uh, let's say the inference engine uh, right, arrived at, yeah, let's say yeah, arrived at its conclusion, um, and let's say right, and its degree of certainty. Um, yeah, I guess its degree of certainty right about its diagnosis. Uh, right about its diagnosis. Um, yeah, I mean, like that's probably what I would write. But again, for these, you know, for these long questions, um, definitely make sure to check the mark scheme. Right? Yeah, make sure you understand everything that they say as well. Um, and I guess yeah, anything you don't understand, you know, you can just ask in the comments, and well, even me or someone else can try to explain it. Right. Eleven. A company has a website. Users on the internet. Uh, yeah. Okay. Right. So users use the internet and the World Wide Web to access the website. Describe the difference between the internet and the World Wide Web. Um, Right, so I think we can say, well, internet is basically going to be the, I mean, there's a few things, right? One is the physical infrastructure. So, you know, the physical wires, like the fiber optic cables, the satellites, um, yeah, obviously the routers, right, you know, everything. Um, but it's also going to be the protocols, things like, you know, uh, let's say, well, TCP, IP. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously other things, you know, let's say like email protocols, video streaming protocols. Uh, yeah, things like SSH, right, you know, FTP, right, all these different protocols. Um, so let's just say that, let's say uh, the internet, uh, right, yeah, the internet uh, is, uh, let's say, physical infrastructure, uh, right, e.g., and again, let's say, uh, well, cables. Um, so yeah, this could be what, twisted pair, could be fiber optic. Um, yeah, I don't know, you know, we can say satellites. Uh, right, let's say routers, right, etc. Um, right, and also protocols. Uh, right, and protocols. Uh, right, so e.g., well, IP. I mean, IP literally means internet protocol. Um, but you know, we can also mention, uh, let's say FTP, uh, let's say SSH. Uh, I mean, we can mention email protocols. So email protocols like S, uh, let's say SMTP. Um, yeah, like POP3, IMAP, right, various email protocols. 
you know, here I wouldn't really want to mention HTTP because HTTP is more really just about websites, so it kind of comes onto World Wide Web. Um, yeah, you can also mention about TCP as well, right? TCP, UDP. Uh, right, I guess we can say, you know, in contrast, uh, right, World Wide Web. Um, yeah, and I was thinking, can we say www, but I mean, they haven't actually listed www here. Uh, so I think let, let's just say it again, right, World Wide Web. Um, and in, in here, let's put brackets www, right, so we can refer to this later if we need to. Uh, so we say, right, this is the collection, uh, or what well, we can say network or collection, uh, maybe let's say collection, um, right, of interconnected web pages. Uh, yeah, interconnected web pages or well, websites, web pages, uh, right, via hyperlinks. Um, and let's say, uh, and it may be accessed via HTTP. Um, and let's put in brackets here, right, HTTPS, because obviously it could be, well, the standard unencrypted, right, or it could be the S, so secure or encrypted. Um, and yeah, okay, this is the last one, right? So the website has a uniform resource located URL. The URL has three different parts, right? Identify three different parts that are included in the URL. Um, right, I mean, so URL, I'm basically just, you know, the website address. Uh, so let's give an example at like HTTPS. Um, you know, I mean, the www dot is not really required. Um, so let's just not include it. Uh, let's go well, pseudocode pro. Um, let's go pseudo dot pro. Uh, all right, well, pseudocode. Um, and let's go right slash editor. So yeah, this is the actual unit you know, editor page, right? The main code editor. So what we can see then, well, the first part here is going to be the protocol, right? The HTTPS, uh, right? The next one, well, the uh, I guess we can call it the domain, right? The website name, right? Pseudocode.pro. Um, and then the last one, well, slash editor, right? This is going to be, uh, well, we can call it the file, right? The, uh, let's say the file, the path. Um, yeah, I think both of those will be acceptable. Um, so let's just say that, right? Let's say protocol. Uh, right, okay, hang protocol, yeah, like that. Um, and I mean, when it says identify, I mean, let's, yeah, maybe let's give an example, right, e.g. HTTPS. Um, I mean, I think I won't write out the other two. Uh, so the next one, what, let's say domain name. And I mean, really, domain name, you know, you can break down into two parts where, you know, sometimes you would call this like the domain name and then, you know, the .pro.com.org, right, that would be the domain extension. Um, but I think here, you know, they probably just, they're kind of including both of it as one. Um, and of course, you know, you give an example, right, e.g. google.com, right, cambridge.com, whatever. Um, right, then uh, the last one, um, let's say, uh, I don't know, maybe file name or file path. I think file path is probably okay. Um, and let, let's give an example here, like e.g., uh, I don't know, let's say home, right, dot .html. Yeah, that should be a simple example. Right, one function of web browser is to provide an address bar for a user to enter a URL. Right, give three other functions of a web browser. Uh, so let's say maybe page navigation. Um, so when I say navigation, I mean like back and forward. Uh, yeah, uh, so let's just say that, right, back, uh, right, and, uh, well, forward button. Um, right, we can also probably mention history. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess, well, really, history is kind of part of the navigation. It's kind of similar, really. Uh, so let's try something a bit different. We'll go for, like, favorites or bookmarks. Uh, let's say favorites slash bookmarks. Um, and again, you might want to explain this, you know, uh, to store their favorite, you know, favorite websites or favorite pages. Um, and then again, let's try and go for something different. Maybe let's say storing cookies. Um, and I guess we can say, uh, I don't know, to remember user preferences. Uh, I don't know, or let's say, well, remember user, yeah, I, I guess preferences or details. Um, yeah, something like that. And yeah, I'm, I'm trying to think of any others I might say. Uh, I mean, navigation, favorites, bookmarks, you know, I think history, although again, history is similar to number one. Um, yeah, and I, th I think another one you can say where well, it's going to render the web page. So obviously it's going to take the HTML, right, the CSS, the JavaScript, um, and where well, it's going to you know execute the JavaScript, right? It's, it's going to you know process the CSS. Um, but yeah, basically it's just going to it's going to take all of that code and obviously yeah just display the actual web page to the user. Uh, so I guess we can just say that right, render web page. 
uh, let's say yeah from uh, I guess code right you know eg HTML uh, yeah hang right HTML uh, yeah I guess well JS right JavaScript yeah etc um, you know CSS all right and yeah guys so that's all the questions I mean this video has been super long but again hopefully it's useful and if it is then see you again in the next video